It's Comics Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Comics.aadl.org. It just happens to be the comics nexus of the Midwest. I th- Can I say that? Can I say that? Yeah, the guys in the control room are nodding. Uh, my name is Jersey Joe's cart- uh, cartoonist and teaching artist, and this is the show where we talk about comics, comics lifestyle, what it takes to make comics, all the things that go into that, like publishing, self-publishing, distributing your content on the web, collecting your uh, stuff in print and selling it to people going to shows. All sorts of things that, that that all lead up to this visual storytelling uh, medium that we love so much. And uh, I, before we kick into the full discussion, I want to say this special live episode has a contest involved. Uh, later on during the episode, you're going to find out how to get a free pre-pub copy of Raina Telgemeier's drama. Uh, so pay attention. We'll be, we'll be doing a break in the show a little bit later on to tell you how to do that. But uh, the most important thing I got to get to right now is I got to talk to this guy named Eric Orchard of ericorchard.blogspot.com. Inky Bat on Twitter. And uh, gosh, you're on the Google Plus and the Facebook and uh, Blogger, Tumblr, <laughs> any, any place where there's an internet, there's you, it seems. I have a, I have a compulsive personality. I, I treat the internet the same way I treat art supplies. I'll just grab whatever's off the shelf. <laughs> I'm the same way. Like whenever I find out about a new service, I usually dive in just to grab the username uh, in case yeah. it takes off. You know, uh, mm-hmm. so I was you know just tried out Mobley the other day and was uh, sorely disappointed. And I'm very angry about what my experience uh, happened with that. But it could be my fault. Yeah. I don't know. But uh, but anyway, so uh, you know, you let's let's go through your credits real quick here, Eric. Uh, gosh, you were in the nur- nursery rhyme crom- <laughs> nursery rhyme comics. I- I was. What an honor that was. That was super cool. That was a big shock to me. The editor, Chris, got a hold of me and said, do you want to be a part of this? And when I saw, like, you know, it involved, like, Jules Pfeiffer, uh, you know, uh, Jaime Hernandez, and, like, just people I grew up reading. I was bowled over. So I jumped at the chance to do that. That was such a great opportunity. And, uh, you know, I love working with First Second. You know, those people are wonderful. It's it's the, uh, it's the Pixar of comics. I've, I've said that many, many times. You know, everything they put out is amazing. It's it's quality every time, you know. And it's actually been nominated for an Eisner, so that's nice. This is my first time being associated with anything Eisner-ish, you know. So that's, <laughs> I'm really happy about that. Oh, well, congratulations yeah. for that. That's that's awesome. I mean, Thanks. it's it's a great-looking book. It's it's an awesome book with a lot of great pieces in it. It Let's is. See. You also do uh, children's books. Um, terrible, That's how I started. Terrible, horrible, smelly pirate. Anything yes. but Hank. Yes, yes. Uh, all available on Amazon. Uh, Eric Kloster in the chat will be no doubt grabbing links to those things. Uh, Maddie Kettle. Mm-hmm. Uh, Saturday morning webtoons. Tell us yes. about this. There's another thing you're involved with. Oh, I'm getting tired just listening to this. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's a lot of stuff, isn't it? Um, and I'm always offering my services elsewhere. I got to slow down. It's, <laughs> it's, it, comics are so exciting and, and so much fun to be involved with. You just want to grab at everything. And, yeah. You know, it's one of those things you learn. You, you learn to start saying no after a while. Um, you, ha- you have to as a self-preservation know. mechanism, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I'm a stay-at-home dad too, so I've got all those sort of. They're, you know, they're, I, I got to balance things. Got to learn how to juggle. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be doing the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon song <laughs> someday. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But yeah. but you're right, you're right. It's Brandon Dayton of BrandonDayton.com posted on Twitter the other day, and, and, and this, this was a, a painful truth that I think we all have to face, is that like if you want to tell a lot of stories really fast, uh, don't get into comics, because it, it's so labor-intensive, and yet it's so exciting that it's really easy to find yourself suddenly spread really, really thin. I've run into this many times. Now, I'm not saying that about you, I'm saying this specifically about no. myself, but... But man, you've been all over the map here. Uh, also, let's talk. I want to talk about Saturday morning webtoons real quick. So this is another neat thing that you've been involved with. Now you're not doing this all yourself, thank goodness. No, no. It's a, this is something that uh, Jay Torres dreamed up, and uh, Jay lives not not that far from me, and, and we've been friends for the last couple of years. Uh, I love his work. I, uh, it's actually funny. I met him 10, 12 years ago at Strange Adventures. Uh, he was doing a signing tour with Jay Bone. And I was as yet unpublished. And uh, he was just a really cool guy. And I, I really liked him. And we've been in touch a lot lately. And he wanted to work with me. And so he asked me to do these, these, uh, these one-line joke, two-line joke sort of comics with him on, on Saturday Morning Webtoon. So I, I jumped up the chance. It's been really fun. And the talent on there is amazing. I didn't realize who's going to be involved. So it's like, you know, it's like Jack uh, Brilio and uh, I can't even, uh, you know, Jay Bone and 
Andy Watson, like just like, you know, people whose work I love. So it's been, you know, pretty cool. Yeah. That, that is awesome. And that, that, that's a comic strip that updates every Saturday with yeah. a bunch of kid friendly, fun cartoons. Right. So it's like, exactly. so it's like Saturday morning cartoons, but you know, for the, for the internet generation. Right. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, it's got a wide readership. It keeps growing uh, and it's a lot of fun. So yeah, I look forward to doing that every week. And so, okay, so you've got your foot in the uh, traditional publishing world, uh, in the web comics world, but then you also do mini comics on top of all this other stuff. So, uh, you know, you got Harry and Silvio.blogspot.com where people can get actual, like, yeah. good old fashioned, black and white stapled mini comics. Uh, right here. <laughs> oh, here hold that up. Let's see that. I want, I want to, so people can uh, get it at home. Uh, Harry and Silvio and the girl in the purple boat. Uh, there's a Facebook page yeah. for this, too, is there not? As I started a fan page for that, um, and yeah, it's it's been a really popular comic. And, and uh, I call, I did a I sent it to Top Shelf, and they're publishing they're publishing it as as a collection, uh, uh, a one long story. So that's coming out next year. Oh, awesome! So okay, now you're involved with First, Second, and Top Shelf. Those are both okay. no small potatoes when it comes to uh, the world of uh, non superhero comics, right? Yeah, yeah. I can so, definitely say my dreams have all come true in, in the comics world. It's a uh, Definitely beyond my expectations so far. Yeah. Well, good for you. Uh, but then, okay. So now we got to talk about this. This is, the, this is where I want to really drive a lot of the conversation today. Yeah. Is so that uh, you know, you release the cover just this afternoon or this morning, yes. rather. Yes. For the new book you're doing, Marrow Bones. Okay. Yes. So we got the traditional publishing, got the mini comics, got the web comics. Now you're doing PDF comics. Mm -hmm. uh, just try to stop this guy, everybody. Uh, Marrow Bones can be found on your blog spot, right, Eric Orchard? Now, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna take it to uh, Drive Through Comics as well, and hopefully, you know, like Apple and stuff down the road. But well, after I have a few issues out, I want it to start getting it into more, more shops, storefronts. So this is a, this is a personal project, yes. It is. It's it's stories that I've, I've been collecting for about you know twenty years, like since I was a little kid, and uh, thirty years, and and you know really wanted to to tell. And you know publishing works so slowly. Like you you know you, you have an idea, you, you present it, and you know it goes through the editing process, editing process, and it can take years for a book to come out. So I, this is just my way of just getting more material out there and being more visible. Mm -hmm. and, and and telling the stories I really want to tell, you know, so that's it. Well, that, that's cool to hear, too, is that, you know, like sometimes uh, publishing, get, being published is awesome, right? I mean, I'm sure you, you'll, you'll back me up on that statement. Oh, yeah. But then, but also, as you pointed out, it, it's a long process, too. And also, when editorial voices get into the mix, it can become... Uh, Friction can come out of that. Not yeah. not necessarily bad friction, but friction comes yeah. out of that, which slows down the whole machine because everybody wants to make the project the best thing it can be. But there's yeah. something liberating about just diving in and doing exactly the thing that you want to do, right? And, and not have to answer to anybody. Um, but, you know, the thing about Marrowbones is this is a uh, this is a scary comic for kids. This is a kid's horror comic. And I want to talk about that quite a bit with you. But before we go into the whole talking about making scary comics for kids uh, and what that means... Uh, I wonder if you tell us a little bit about the premise of Marabones so people can go to the site and check it out today. Absolutely, yeah. It's about this, this young girl, probably about 11, I think, 11, kind of 11, 12, around that age. Her name's Nora, and uh, she's basically been abandoned by her parents at this school called the Hillgrove School for Haunted Children, which is this awful place where they take children who are vampires, werewolves, can see ghosts, etc., and try to, you know, get it out of them. And uh, so she's there for a while, and then she's rescued by her uncle, Barnaby, and taken to this other world called Marrowbones. Barnaby happens to be a werewolf who also is an innkeeper, and she works at the inn. So she becomes this sort of adventurer in this secondary world called Marrowbones, which is this big, sprawling swamp filled with monsters and creatures. And she becomes sort of this protective um, character in, in, in this other world. And, uh, and, and it's about her trying to find home and, and family uh, after being rejected by her own family. And, and in this, this new place, that's very strange and, and very creepy. And sometimes and it, dangerous. It, it's, it's very dangerous. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it, you know, it, it's, which is something you can't really, I didn't want to, to give that to a traditional publisher because marketing that would be a pain, you know? So I thought, let's, let's do this really weird stuff on my own. And uh, so that's the premise of, of Marrowbones. It's about the, the hero is, is Nora and 
she basically looks after uh, monsters and, and weirdos in a, in a swamp in, in another world. <laughs> Now, I, you know, it's always dangerous to try to describe somebody's style. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, what's that? I've had people describe it better than that. <laughs> oh, no, no. I mean, I was going to try to describe the art for those who are just listening and not actually watching. Because oh, yeah. the, the, the guys in the production were actually pulling up artwork and showing your work while you're talking about it, which is awesome. Oh, uh, okay. And that's why people should watch the video, actually, then listen to the audio. All of the audio is cool, too. Um, but... Uh, cute scary you know it's scary but it's not it's not threatening scary uh it's uh the kind of like fun creepy uh if that makes any sense um yeah i like i like cute stuff yeah, yeah. I, i'm uh, i'm really attracted to, to cute art so <laughs> <laughs> uh but but at the same time it's still creepy right it's like like when you know in the in the new book that's coming out and you said it's gonna be out next week uh, at the time of this recording um Oh, it's it's Oliver's Oliver's tomb. Is that the name of the book? Yeah, that's the name of the book. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's there's some really scary stuff with the ghoul that happens in there, and as we all yes. know, what what ghouls are and what ghouls do, you know, it's not a pleasant thing. So you know, uh, it's it's still creepy, but you know, it, it's like uh, I want to talk about like specific art stuff in a second, but it, maybe start a little bit higher up. Yeah. Uh, as a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy who does, you know, I, I stay strictly PG-13 and under in my work, and that's just a taste thing. That's the kind of entertainment I like, and that's the kind of stuff I like to make. But I do love scary movies, but very specific kinds of scary movies. And I'm wondering if you could speak to this, is that, like, I can't sit through Saw. Uh, watching say that. Yeah, I'm the same. Yeah, absolutely. Watching people get tortured by a really sick and deranged guy. I mean, I'm not saying that people who watch that are sick and deranged. You know, there's, there's all kinds of thrills of horrification, but I just personally can't sit through that. Uh, but movies about monsters and the devil, like The Prince of Darkness by John Carpenter is one of my favorite horror films. And it's, awesome. yeah. it's a great movie. Alice Cooper as a zombie. How does it get any better than that? Uh, but, you know, I try to explain this to people. I'm like, well, how can you sit through that? Because there's some gross stuff that happens in that. I'm like, well, but it's like elevated. It's like it's like superhero horror because it's so elevated and so detached from real life. It's like it's like uh, watching the gods do battle, but with monsters. Is is that yeah. kind of is, is that where you come from when you're doing stuff like this? I think so. I think, I think for me, when I think of horror, you know, I think of mood more than anything. So, you know, the act of, you know, like, the, you know, the buckets of gore. And, and, and the dismemberments aren't that interesting to me. But capturing a certain type of mood or feeling yeah. um, is, is really interesting to me. Like I was listening to an interview with uh, Christopher Lee from uh, who played Dracula in the horror in the Hammer horror films, and he said that he never considered the Hammer movies to be horror. He always considered them to be fantasy mm -hmm. because you were entering a different world and, and with different rules, and, and it was about the atmosphere in that world. Um, and to me, that's really interesting. I, you know, I, I'm not at all interested in, in sort of, you know, I feel bad for, uh, 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 you know, for, for, but it's like, it, you know, it's like Halloween is a great movie, yeah. but it ruined everything, you know, <laughs> it's, that brought in the, that brought in the, the, you know, the killing the virgins and the, yeah. and, and the teenage, you know, and, and, and I think a lot of people recognize that that was sort of the beginning of the end. Um, who did Halloween again? Uh, oh, wasn't wasn't that Carpenter who did the first one? Carpenter. I was going to say Carpenter, but yeah, it's getting mixed up. And I think even Carpenter recognizes that 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 was sort of when it all became repetitive and boring and and just sort of not interesting. And I, you know, I think for you know, and I read a lot of like I'm a big fan of uh, Victorian ghost stories as well, mm -hmm. and that's really my starting point. My favorite authors are uh, a lot of my favorite authors write short fiction in the Victorian era, like M.R. James, uh, Sheridan Le Fanu. Like these guys were writing these awesome, creepy stories that were just brilliant concepts, wonderful aesthetic, just perfect. And and it's a world away of what you would think of as horror. Uh, I think there's a you know I mean there's a there's a bit of it coming back you know with with Hammer Studios coming back and doing things like uh, you know the the you know the Woman in Black and uh, Let the White Right One In and then you know the movie The Others uh, with with Nicole Kidman that sort of touches on that sort of thing as well. Okay. Uh, so and I'm also really influenced by by Mike Mignola in this sense because he 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 does that sort of thing really well too where. 
you know, it's not about the gore. It's about the atmosphere and building a world, especially, especially in the Hellboy books. Oh yeah. 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 The Hellboy books are, are fantastic for that. And, yeah. and, and the Hellboy movies are actually pretty darn good. They did an amazing job yeah. of capturing really scary stuff, but in a way yeah. that didn't feel, uh, exploitive and, and, and distasteful. You know, there's people getting mauled by terrible monsters, but it feels like it's, it has that detachment and it, yeah. has, and it has that mood. Uh, yeah. so mood, that's interesting, interesting that you talk so much about that because, uh, I'm wondering with the style that you choose, if that's what's hot on your mind because when i'm looking at marrow bones uh i, I wrote this down as i was reading it it's like uh you know text really richly textured line art but then a uh, very limited color palette mm. and uh and in the illustrations like the poses of the characters and the shots you choose came across as very soft spoken very understated almost you know it's like when a monster jumps out in marrow bones it's not this crazy jack kirby speed lines all over the place you know and, and uh popping out of the panel or anything like that it feels very um quiet and eerie in a way does that does that make sense does that sound fair to, to describe that, your work? Uh, yeah i think that's absolutely accurate it probably goes to the kind of com you know the kind of stories i comics i read which like i love kirby but i mean i'm i I grew up reading like, you know, Love and Rockets and, and uh, you know, Spiegelman and, and, you know, like stuff that wasn't over the top, that was sort of, had that sort of, the storytelling was very, you know, it was, uh, it was quiet. I, you know, I like that. I, you know, that's a good description. I think that's, that's really accurate. That's, it's how I feel about my work. I, and I also feel like it's not me. And if I started doing Kirby, you know, speed lines and, and, mm -hmm. You know, the, you know, it's, people do that so well. Like, Mignola does that well. I don't need to do that. Other people do it so well. So I'm going to do something different and just, just have a quieter approach. And, yeah. uh, and I think that appeals to some people. So I think I'm doing it right. It's not like, you know, I don't see it as an oversight. I see it as, as a sort of intentional and truthful way to approach it, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is something that I think uh, all artists struggle with when they're creating their their work. Uh, uh, when I say work, I mean like the body of work over their lifetime is figuring out what is it that is intrinsically me about this? How do you find your voice? That kind of thing, right? For sure. And then all of these, you know, it's, it's better nowadays, but in, in the old days when there were like very few how to draw comics books, yes. there, there was a propensity for, well, this is the way to do it, kid. <laughs> and so when I, wouldn't, when I wasn't doing it that way, I was like, why am I doing this wrong? Why am I doing this? And then, oh, it turns out that I was just heading in a different direction uh, than, yes. than what that particular book was trying to teach me. So, yeah, I mean, finding your voice is, is super, super important. But I, I was making that comparison mostly just as like a, a very vivid way to describe how unique your work feels. It's not to say that, well, you're not meeting the Kirby standard. I got my yeah, yardstick I here. <laughs> I totally know what you were saying. I was just trying to go, go into a bit of my thinking behind it as well. Because, you know, it's, it's, I have been fairly thoughtful about that. But, you know, comics are such a complex thing that it's sort of like, it's almost like a reciprocity failure. You can only do so much and, and the end result is going to surprise you. So some of that stuff you don't notice till after and then you try to enhance it. You know, it's like, oh, this is what the, the mood feels like. In book two, I'm going to try to push this a little more yeah. because, you know, I discovered it through the process in book one. So, yeah. So, okay, I, I've got a I've got a big important question to ask you. But before I go into that, because one of the re the reason I was also noticing this is that uh, in my work, one of the things I try to focus on, not to make this about me, but just for comparison's sake, is that. Uh, yeah. I try to focus on capturing energy as much as I can. So, like anybody who's ever seen my warm-up sketches, it always features a laser and an explosion because that's yeah. that's what's going on in my head all the time. I like that yeah. stuff, uh, and it's always trying to find the, just the right frame and the movement to capture that sense of energy and kinetic stuff. So, uh, years ago, I, I tried doing a scary moment in a story, as scary as I could do at any rate, and uh, I, I tried drawing the, the monster, you know, in in a frightening way, but it came across as being like almost uh, it was just, it was it was just too over the top it, it didn't feel like that frightening coiled dog about to get you it felt more like this slobbering thing in your face it almost came across as like it, it crossed the threshold of scary into goofy and so i was just wondering if there was like a rule of thumb and i don't want to say this as an application for every artist but i'm just wondering if like you know when you're trying to be creepy perhaps you do have to tone back some of the movement which leads to my big question Lumbering zombies or running zombies? Lumbering. <laughs> which, uh, 
<laughs> but some people might disagree with. I mean, 28 days later is awesome, and that's scary. And actually, I love how the zombies move or how the vampires move in that uh, 30, uh, 30 days a night. But yeah, I like lumbering better. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, uh, but you know, I'm a Romero fan. I yeah. think I think that's the gold standard of zombies for me. So <laughs> now you know it, it, the way I, I've always described it to my friends is uh, is that with lumbering zombies, there's the inevitable dread. It can't yes. it can't get better. It can't uh, because no matter how fast you run, you're gonna get tired. They're not, and uh, you, it's it's inevitable. And it's like as I remember watching The Omen with my wife, and she was like, "Turn it off, turn it off, turn it off." And I was like, "Whoa, what's, what's the big deal?" And she's like, "It's like I I can see that this is not going to end well. It's too dreadful. The dread is too heavy on this film." I'm like, "That's yeah. why the film is interesting." She's like, "Yeah, but it's too much for me." You know, and I, and I think that's what I like about the lumbering zombie is that heavy dread that is never always present. It's, it's always present, but it's never on screen necessarily. Yeah. Whereas yes. with running zombies, it's more like wild animals, and yeah, wild animals yeah. are scary. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a different type of fear. It's uh you know, one fear is like that, that creeping, crawling fear that leaves you scared when you turn off the lights at night. The other kind is the, the animal fear is the kind you can leave behind, you know? It's like, oh yeah, wolf, that's fine, you know, yeah. like, or a bear. Yeah. You know, you're not gonna, you know, you're not, someone's not gonna stay up at night too worried about that, you know, unless you live in Alaska in a paper house, but it's sort <laughs> of like, it's, you know, it's not the kind of thing that's, that's gonna stick with you like a creeping fear, I feel. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think you're right. It's like uh, a wild animal activates fight or flight response. Where uh, <laughs> exactly? Where Small brain. yeah, 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 and then and then the zombies slowly just bumping into your house until there's enough of them to push their way in is like this this ever present heavy just leaded dread. Uh, so yeah, well, okay. I, I'll be pretentious and, and call it a more intellectual fear. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Well, you get the, <laughs> you were published by first seconds. So you get to say that. <laughs> and you're Canadian, so everybody knows that you mean well. Uh, okay, well, we're closing in on the halfway point. So this is where I'm going to take a break for a second from talking about zombies and bears attacking you. I'm talking about something a little bit more lighthearted. Okay, in my hands, everybody, in my hand, is uh, Raina Tuggemeyer's pre-pub uh, advanced reader's copy of the book, her upcoming book, coming out, I think, September, Raina? You're in the chat, am I right? This coming out in this fall? Uh, this book, I finished it uh, this last weekend, and I can tell you that I think it's going to be one of the most important and talked about books of the year. Uh, this is this is Eisner material, uh, without a doubt. It, it's it's so, so emotionally engaging. Uh, the story is, it's about it's another rite of passage, passage story about a young girl who gets involved in the theater, theater department uh, in seventh grade, and it's all that middle school transformation stuff that happens. There's some wonderful, wonderful character twists and uh, plot twists, and it's sandwiched in this great metaphor of uh, a theater production. So the curtain opens at the beginning, the characters walk onto the stage, the story begins, there's an intermission at just the right point where there should be an intermission, and then it closes with the curtain falling and the lights going down. Okay, so you need to read this book. You will not be sorry if you read this book. Uh, and Rain is going to give away a free copy. If you go to the Twitters right now, oh, it comes out September 1st. Thank you, Raina. Uh, if you go to the Twitters right now and type a message with the hashtag, Drama CAG for Comics Are Great. So hashtag Drama CAG Comics Great. In a half hour, we're going to announce the winner of this. Now, d you can just type hashtag Drama CAG in the chat, but here's where you could do me a solid. is uh, If you want to make me happy, you could say, Raina Telgemeier is a national treasure, hashtag Drama CAG, or uh, Drama is definitely the read of the year. Anybody who cares about comics, anybody who has young people in their life should buy this book. And uh, I created a short link that you can use in the post. Uh, it is, let's see, where did I put it? It is comicsaregreat.com slash drama. That'll take you to the pre-order page. So you could point at that. That would be helpful. You know, point to comicsaregreat.com slash drama. Uh, and then use the hashtag drama CAG. And then Rain is going to randomly select one of those people to, uh, at the end of the show to give a copy, a uh, pre-pub copy of this book. Now it is a pre-pub, so only part of it is in color. Uh, let's see if I can do that. There we go. And the rest is in black and white because it is, you know, it's it's just a proof copy for uh, advanced readers. But 
Don't let that stop you. It's an amazing, amazing book. You will not be sorry. So everybody go do that right now while and while you listen to me and Eric continue to talk about some of this awesome comic stuff. So thank you, Raina Telgemeier of GoRaina.com for uh, you know, helping me out with this contest. Uh, so, okay, Eric, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Yeah, your video froze for some reason, but hopefully it'll kick back in. Uh, oh, okay. Love Raina's work, by the way. Big, big fan. Oh, that's awesome. Well, she, yeah, she, she is... Uh, she she is a force of nature. Nature. Uh, the way one of the things I told her the other day when I was talking to her was that uh, she she deals with some very important up to date issues that kids are facing, and uh, she does it with, with such ninja like deftness. So yes. it's, uh, it's 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 amazing. It's a, it's a fantastic book. One of the best books I've read in years. So uh, anyway, uh, you know what? I want to talk a little bit more about this um, Marrow Bones book. So the book comes out uh, yep. next week. So, you know, only a few days oh, after this episode yeah, is collected. Say that again? Mm -hmm. I'm hoping Monday. Because you spent a long time on that cover. I want to talk about that cover. <laughs> you posted that today, and that was at uh, ericorchard.blogspot.com and also on Google+, which I want to talk about a little bit in a second. Um, you, you work on the Cintiq, yes? I do. I do. I, I've, uh, I work a lot on the Cintiq. I love it. It's uh, it's my tool of choice right now uh, when not working traditional. You you got the the big one that's on like the the hinge that can move around like a like an art table kind of dealy. Yeah yeah yeah. Here look here it is. Oh cool we actually Whoa. get to see it. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you're you're uh, you're inking <laughs> you're inking and painting digitally, but um, one of the things that. I was really surprised when I saw that. Is that you know your work has kind of like a scratch board effect look to it? Uh, did you find it difficult to capture that digitally, or I mean, what's the, what's the the trick to doing that? Uh, I don't know. Like when um, when I do kids books, I, I I work in gouache, and and my sort of method for gouache has always been to go way too dark and then pull out the highlights uh, using lighter colors. So it's just sort of natural for me when I pick up a new medium to continue that that sort of process. So what I've been doing with, with Marrowbones is I'll, I'll, again, I'm working in Manga Studio to do, the, to do the, the line work and then I take it to Photoshop to do the colors. So Manga Studio, I just dump blacks with the, with the uh, uh, paint bucket and then I'll etch into it afterwards. Oh. And, yeah, and that's, that's a lot of what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm etching in with whites afterwards. And I also use uh, a lot of pattern tools. Um, you guys know Ray Frendon? Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Ray's done a lot of uh, brushes, uh, texture brushes, pattern brushes that aren't available uh, through uh, Mango Studio, but you can download them and use them. And I love Ray's uh, pattern brushes. Uh, uh, he's done a bunch that I that I use a lot. So it's a combination of etching into blacks, pattern brushes. And then I do all that in Manga Studio, and then I transfer it over to um, Photoshop. And once I'm in there, once again, I start hatching into it with color lines instead of black and white lines. So I'm, I'm, I continue that process of hatching and building up layer upon layer. And it's just, it's a compelling way for me to work, you know? It's sort of how I think if the old masters had some teaks, it's what they would do. They they build up. They do that sort of patient, fun way of working that I so, love. Yeah, it's like a sculpting almost. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how I treat it. So I'm I'm curious about how like if you would, could describe the way you look at things, because um, like you know, uh, my style developed into a contour based system of uh, always really thinking about the outer contour and the the, the body as shapes that are interacting. Um, but my wife, on the other hand. Uh, Anne is um, she's so adept at capturing color and texture. Like we, we could draw, we did this. We uh, we went on vacation once. We were both drawing the same tree, and with me, it just turned into this contour with a bunch of scratchy lines in the middle to try to <laughs> futile attempt to represent the texture of the bark. But she f zoomed right in on that bark. Did you find that the way you look at things changed when you, the more you started to work in this this way of like sculpting shapes out with lines? Yeah, I think so. Every medium I try, it's like when you close your eyes, you can still see yourself working in that medium. And when I started doing, when I trained in oil paints in art college, and, and you know, every night I go to sleep seeing oil paint. There was, <laughs> you, you know, uh, uh, Charlie Harper, the uh, the illustrator, mid-century illustrator. Yeah. Uh, 
he talks about how people have, there's different types of people. Some people see detail and some people see shapes. And, and I think that's a significant, you know, separation of two different types of artists. Harper himself, he sees shapes. So he draws nature in these beautiful, um, designy kind of juxtaposition of shapes and colors that can that verge towards the abstract. I tend, you know, and then I tend to, or someone like, you know, the opposite would be like a Gustave Doré or someone who tends to see life as, as a built up of, uh, you know, contoured description. So, uh, and I t I'm probably somewhere in the middle of that, but I tend to more see detail than, than simple shapes more than anything. But I work hard at finding those shapes. So that's, it's something I'm aware of. So, but yeah, it has, to, it has in, informed how I work, like the, the, that sculptural quality, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So is this something where, um, does it start as like a predisposition and turns into a skill? Is that, or, or is it something where it's just like, it's innate and I'm just aware that it's innate and I'm just, you know, just, uh, responding to that does that make any sense that i just ask like a bunch of nonsense philosophical questions what i'm trying to say is like for for the young artist who's listening or the beginning artist who's listening and like i don't know if i'm a detail person or a shape person uh mm -hmm. is that something where you know you can kind of figure out um is that something you can figure out and then develop and hone that skill is that was that what you did uh yeah i think so i think it's about having like a i think one of the big things about you know when you're a young artist something to, to do is be somewhat self-aware of what you're doing so that you know you know the correct paths to take your work um and, and it's, it's sort of building up a certain objective quality to viewing your own work which is really hard yeah. uh and, and, you know to me it goes hand in hand with objectively being able to take good criticism it's really difficult at first and, and, and uh, I still struggle with it. I still want to get angry sometimes when someone, you know, disses my work, even when it's the kindest thing they could possibly be doing. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, it, you know, and I think that self-awareness and knowing where to take your work is an integral part of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of developing as an artist. It also, you know, it, it'll let you know if you're drawing too much like someone else as well or, you know, copying another style too closely. So you sort of, you, you, you develop this objective way of knowing, hey, this is the kind of work I do. I'm going to follow it. And, and, and I think that comes out of experimenting and, and, and being objective and, and, uh, and, and, and playing a lot. So, you know, art is a playful thing. It's, it's, you got you to gotta play and then think about what you're doing at the same time. Does that yeah. make sense? Well, you know, I think that that's not an unfair thing to ask of a cartoonist because we are making so many choices on every page anyway. If you can't yes. multitask and also think about what you're doing while you're doing it, you're going to find yourself in trouble, you know. Uh, and, and I say think about what you're doing while you're doing it. Sometimes that happens in a very kind of gushy, yeah. fog-like way, right? It's not like you're, you're not going, I am drawing a line right now, right? Exactly. <laughs> don't edit while you're working, but, you know... Have be, have a good have good judgment while you're working without editing. Editing should always be done afterwards. You take the stuff away afterwards, but you you know you can just sort of be aware while you're working and and like oh this is cool I'm gonna follow this this you know I don't know yeah I, it's hard to talk about this stuff it's because uh, <laughs> it's. Uh, it's ephemeral. It gets away from me easy. Well, and, and also it's, it's so much, so at least from my, my own experience, it's a back and forth, uh, of, of, it's a back and forth process of being zoomed out and zoomed in, uh, of being in this mindset and that mindset. And this is one of the reasons, uh, years ago I did a podcast series called your comic from the ground up with Mark Rudolph on the art and story podcast. And it was an, a, a, an attempt to try to create a, okay, as, as of right now, this is how I understand how I make comics. But one of the things I had, I had to keep disclaiming it, saying, like, well, it's really not this linear. You know, you're zooming back and forth. And to try to turn it into a six part series is artificial because the process of making a thing is not linear. You don't just well, do this step first and this step next and this step next. And bingo, you got a comic and it's going to make a million dollars. You know? Yeah, that's a great point. Like, I, it's hard to talk about this stuff objectively because it happens in this sort of weird, all over the place, scattered way. You're never going to be. You know, no one, you know, I, I don't know, it's, you know, we're not architects, we're not, you know, we're not, it's, it's, uh, comics happen in this sort of, it's playing, and it, it's fun, so yeah. it's really hard to sort of say do this, 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 and this, because it changes, you know, and I don't create the same way I did a year ago, so it's, uh, it's hard to sort of 
give advice on that level, but I keep trying. Right. How do you, how do you, how do you give the, the five steps to playing a perfect basketball game or in yeah. your, in your case, a game of hockey, right? Yeah. <laughs> or, or a game of curling. Uh, it's like, yeah. cause each game is going to present its own unique variables to make a completely different game. You can't break it down into a linear thing. So yeah, but it's fun to talk about. That's why we do, you know, this kind of stuff. Okay. It's so much fun to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. I want to talk a little bit about some of your explorations into selling and distributing marrow bones because you've been posting a lot about different uh, online fulfillment services, whether it's Big Cartel, uh, which were some of the other ones you were posting about. Uh, Gum, Gumroad, uh, uh, something junkie, e junkie. Yeah. Um, uh, in, uh, in the aisle was another one that I was looking at. That's right, in the aisle. Um, yeah. Any, any. Anything to report on those on those investigations that you've been doing? Well, uh, it seems like eJunkie might be the best way. With Marabones One, what I did was I set up a, a free account at Mediafire, and I had the uh, after you paid on PayPal, it redirected you to this download file. So you paid for it, and then you could just download this this file, which is fine. It meant I didn't have to email everyone, but a quarter of the time. It was just too confusing, and people would not get that link, and and that's my fault. It, it, it's just, you know, it, it, it was an experiment, and it kind of worked, but I want it to be even clearer next time. So I'm thinking eJunkie might be the way. Um, I was looking at Gumroad, which looks really cool because it's sort of it's about finding your readers in social media, so Twitter, Google Plus. Facebook, you know, you, you grab your readers right from there and it directs you to a download payment link from those uh, places. The difficulty with uh, Gumroad is they don't accept PayPal, which is 90% of my mm. sales. It, it, just, but they're working on it. So hopefully down the road, that'll be a better option. eJunkie does take it. Um, it just sort of does the same thing as I was doing with Mediafire, but it's less hassle. It's more direct. I don't have to worry about um, having to deal with uh, uh, downloads that didn't work because uh, because I'm paying a service. You know, I think it's five bucks a month or something like that. I'm paying them to do it. One of the experiments with Marabones One was to do a zero overhead thing. I paid no money to do Marabones One. The uh, you know the <clears throat> the software and the hardware had already paid for itself through other projects. So I was just doing a PDF and selling it through free services. And with the money I made from that, I can afford to do, hopefully, pay, paid services to make things a little smoother this time. Cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, the, the technology hasn't quite been sussed out for like these kind of out of the box fulfillment services, has it? Because uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about with the Mediafire thing. When you go to a Mediafire download page, it is not 100% clear on what is actually the thing you're supposed to get, right? And ideally. Exactly. It's. it's Ideally, the moment payment is processed, they would just their download folder would suddenly jump up on the screen saying, "Hey, I got a thing in here for you." Right? That was my hope. You know, that was that's what ideally what I'd like, and I'm hoping eJunkie does a better job with that. Um, you know, I mean, the the, the media fire thing is almost like a MacGyver patch up job. It's not really, it's not perfect. You know, it's it's you know it's it's a bit like sending someone to a Dropbox file or something. It's a little, I don't know, a little bit of a but hack. Yeah, a little exactly. It's a bit of a hack, so it's not it's not set up for that specifically. Um, so hopefully, some uh, you know a startup or, or a company that is set up for that type of thing will do a better job of it. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about some of your experiments in where to host your work because you've just I mean this is one of the reasons people should follow you on Twitter Inky Bat on Twitter uh, go to your Google Plus page if you're on Google Plus Eric Orchard on there uh, also on Facebook because you post you share a lot of your in investigations into your model of, of you know how what's the best place for this stuff and so you, yeah. you were messing around with Tumblr WordPress and uh, Blogspot. I mean, you were on Blogspot initially, and then you were also looking at these other two platforms. Uh, I'm wondering if you yes. had any thoughts that you'd collected on what the differences between these different platforms is from your standpoint, the kinds of books you're doing. Well, I love Blogspot. I've been there since the beginning. It's sort of been my uh, my home base for, for blogging. And um, I still think it's great, but the comments have gone down significantly, especially since the rise of Twitter, Facebook, Google+. So it's really not no longer a place for the sort of guided conversations I used to have on my blog. It's become more of a place that 
is, you know, to put our work, to, to share, but it's become one of many places. And the responses I get on my, my Blogspot blog are not significantly different from what I'm getting on Facebook or Twitter or Google+. So, you know, I'm keeping Blogspot. I love it, but it's not the sort of active place it once was three years ago, two years ago. Um, Tumblr seems to be taking over to some degree in the, the whole sh because of its the capability of easy sharing. Yeah, um, and I and I love it for that. Um, I, I haven't really been doing a good job of keeping up on it. The the great uh, sort of the the charm of Tumblr for me is sharing other people's work. It's just so much fun. You can just have this constant stream of stuff going through, and I'm feeling like my own work is getting lost in there because I. I'm just not sharing enough of my own work. I want, I'm getting excited about other people's work. And it's like my home, my home is filled with other people's work. I don't have any of my own work up. And I kind of treat Tumblr that way as well. Um, but Tumblr is great for sharing uh, that kind of stuff. Pinterest as well is another one. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't figured out a way to get Pinterest to send people back so they can actually buy my work. But it, it gets spread quickly, which is, which is cool. So it's grown in awareness of my work. Um, Twitter and Facebook s still seem like the best places to share your work in a lot of ways in Google Plus. I'm still getting the most sort of active people there. Um, and, and like, I, I, yeah, I really have no idea because it's, it's uh, it, it, you know, everything I try keeps leading back to those social media sites. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've I've been playing around with the idea of running a webcomic on Tumblr, uh, but I haven't been updating it uh, very regularly. I'm I'm curious to see what will happen once I start doing that. But it, it, the the logic seems solid that here's a, 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 an active base of people who want to share images, and as long as you tag them well, so that people discover them. And I and I messed around with this with a, a silly little Cran comic that I do. Uh, and some of them got shared yeah. a lot when I used the right keywords. And it's not that I'm trying to SEO anybody. It's just that there were sharks in this one. So anybody who likes sharks, maybe they'll like this one, you know, and it got passed around a lot, that kind of thing. Yes. Um, but, but yeah, you're right. It's, it's, uh, wordpress.com and, um, and, uh, blogspot. It seems like, uh, the uptake of, of interactivity is kind of diminishing as well. there's all these other platforms for people to be able to zip, zip around from your Facebook page to this other guy's Facebook page without actually leaving the platform. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's almost orchestrated by Facebook. Like it's what they want. Um, so network blogs are posting your, your images within Facebook. It's everything is kept within this little pool, which is kind of a shame actually. It'd be nice if the, if it was a bit more open, but, uh, you know, I, who knows where things are going? It, it changes all the time. So you just got to keep aware of everything and, and Actually, keep trying everything. You know? yeah. It helps to be ruthless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and this is why, yeah, I, th I think you've got the right idea by trying out everything because um, yeah. I just had a conversation yeah. with uh, Casey Van Heis of wintersandlavelle.com yes. about how Tumblr, in, in, in some areas of Tumblr, it's becoming uh, a little bit of a 19-year-old's flame fest. You know, it's like this is the place where we go to, to scream about uh, Cora fanfic, you know, and, and, and yeah. berate people and be mean to people or whatever. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's like every community, you know, let's never forget MySpace, right? It's like in any yeah, moment, yep, it, it could just flip like that in, in a second. So it's always a good idea to keep your ear to the ground. And as soon as a new thing starts, at least grab the username and then you can always cancel your account later on. But that sounds like work. Is it work? No, because... You know, I'm a nerd. I carry around my iPad everywhere. I, you know, I love this stuff. I love chatting with other creators all the time. I love being engaged by that. You know, I draw all the time. I'm always working. I, I make it all work. Like, it just, it's fun. I, I don't really, it's, you know, some of it's time consuming. I mean, when I released Marrow Bones 1, you know, I was emailing tons of people, really, really hustling to get people to, to know what was out there. But, you know, for the most part, it becomes sort of, you know, muscle memory to tweet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. That would explain why I see you so much. I've been following you for going on two years now. And yeah, you, it's, uh, I'm never not reminded that you exist. Right. But it's not, it's not, it's not silly stuff like, oh, I'm eating a sandwich, you know, uh, but yeah. 
but but it does range from it's like Henry and I are you know watching Adventure Time and yeah. or, you know but then it'll be others like here's another Marrow Bones preview you know it's, it's it's like I'm trying to keep that is keep people engaged with what I'm engaged with which runs the gamut from being a dad and a husband to, to doing comic work you know to the business side. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really engaged with all that stuff. And I like to, and I'm fascinated with having this ongoing conversation with people yeah. and people, other people are engaged. And it's an important time in comics to be engaged with that stuff because, you know, as, as Mark Wade said in last episode, you know, it's a time for the first time in 50 years that the creators are in control of, you know, the, the production and, and how it's getting and, and the, uh, the way it's being distributed. So, I'm just super excited right now, and I think other people are. So you're just seeing a lot of excitement and engagement and discussion right now in comics. Oh, man. Thank you for that. That is a perfect segue into a closing thought before we kick into book recommendations. Uh, you know, it's like people sometimes ask. I, I get the occasional email from somebody who says, uh, yeah, Jersey, we all know comics are great. If that battle's been won. We don't need you to do this weekly show, at which point I say, well, then don't listen, because <laughs> I'm having fun. But... Uh, but the, the other thing is, is that, you know, it's like we remember 1993 when comics were getting talked about in mass media, when that whole speculator boom came about. And then what happened? It fell apart. It crashed. And it was worse than it ever was. And I remember honestly having a conversation with a friend of mine uh, as we were working on a, a published project. This would be around like 2000 or so. And he said, you know, I don't even know if there's going to be a comics industry in five years, you know. And I remember thinking, like, that; those words hit me really hard. Like, oh, that, that's terrifying. You know, we, we, yeah. th there needs to be something. Uh, and at that time, you know, the Internet was pretty new. It, it, I didn't know about web comics yet. So, you know, it, it seemed like a really scary time. So here's, here's what I was thinking. Is that now that, the, you know, the normals are talking about us again and we have a voice in this conversation, let's put our best foot forward. <laughs> Let's make sure yeah. that, that it doesn't. Nineteen ninety three never happens again. Remember the Alamo, everybody. Let's not yeah. let let's not do this again. Let's let's do the best job we can to be to give to give a representation of this medium to the right yeah. people. Uh, and and since we're the ones who actually have to say it, and not necessarily the publishers and the you know the say it ain't so Joes. Um, you know, it, it, maybe it'll be better this time. So that's that's my segue into, well, not a segue, but that's where I can turn to Sharon Iverson, one of the bridge uh, bridge conduits to, for between us and the normals. Sharon Iverson of the Ann Arbor District Library. Oh. Compared to the bridge parts and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're our you're our, uh, our translator, our conduit, our our medium. You're you, you're doing the seance to get us to be able to talk with the normal people who don't uh, spend all day thinking about Pinterest and and Facebook and storytelling. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's book recommendations time, Eric. So if you want to, uh, I'll, I'll let Sharon start, and then we'll kick over to talking about the books. You said you might have some to talk about too, and then and when we close the book recommendations, Rain is going to announce the winner of the prepub oh, copy of Drama. Awesome. So. Uh, Okay, what so, do you got? What so do you got? What's up? I didn't know who your guest was until just you know when you sent out the email, and yeah. I have a book that maybe fits in that kind of creepy weird mode. It's Doug to Naple. Oh, and right. it's Bad Island. Um, Doug to Naple, always a win. Yeah, yeah. here. Do you want to play it? Right, right. Yeah, they they've got the camera monitor right there, oh, so people okay. can see it. So you can All even right. open it up and look at the pages, and Matt will oh, zoom in on it. It's it's a fun story about a family who the dad is insistent that they're all going to bond together. The the teen son Reese is like. Dad, I, I, I'll stay home, go to football practice, I promise that's all I'll do, um, and I won't get into trouble, but Dad says, nah, you're coming with us, and it ends up on this boat trip that, of course, the storm comes along, and they crash on an island, and this island um, becomes a survival story for, th for them that involves some really odd creatures and things that they keep discovering, some of which might help them survive and some of it which might bring them to their doom. Oh, cool. Yeah, and so, of course, and, and there's what you find out, there's another story from another part of the universe involved in Bad Island. Mm -hmm. So so that's a fun um, book to check out. Um, the other book I have is actually kind of weird, but in a historically real sense. Oh. Um, it's, uh, you know me, I like uh, nonfiction. And this is The Lives of Sacco and Vanzetti. 
and I don't know if we're... Is that, is that even going to show on the screen when you need to lift it up? Yeah, there you go. Like got so. That. Um, it's basically the story of what happened in the events that led to the trial of Sacco and Vanzetti, two Italian ar anarchists back in the 1920s and involving the murder of some... Um, in a in a bank heist or actually money um, heist, um, two guards are killed, and these two men become uh, the the accused in the crime. And as a result, um, you find out about the most interesting um, court system in Massachusetts at the time. the oh. The judge who has some issues. Um, with the whole anarchist movement is pretty much convinced that these guys are going to be convicted. And so as the um, Rick Geary presents the book, it's pretty much a situation of the um, reality of uh, presenting the facts. And what's cool is, as he does, he'll give you the, the layout of what happened. So it's sort of like you get to decide, are these guys guilty? Are they criminals? Um, or are they actually victims of, at that time, the American trial system? Wow, sounds pretty thought-provoking. So uh, yeah. who, who published this? This is uh, APA. Good question. Yeah, I just want to, because this is, I, I've not seen this before. Uh, Nantier Beal, oh boy, Minoutush, Minoustishin. <laughs> uh, Comic Slit is an imprint and trademark of ABM. So, uh, yeah, so that is the, the Lives of Sacco and Vanzetti. By Rick Geary. He does he does all these murder crime things, um, brings them that are kind of from the early twentieth century and they're all black and white, but that kind of lends itself to the yeah. you know, the historical bit. And uh, you in particularly in this one, I've read some of his other stuff, but in this one, you know, you kind of he tries to be the presenter of the facts, you know, <laughs> here are the facts, ma'am, and you decide, is this in fact? Um, Eli's in the chat and he's saying, Eli Nyberger, Ulotricus on Twitter, everybody. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he says that's the same publisher for all of Rick Geary's Treasury of Victorian Murders, which yeah. I believe we talked about yep. on the show before. If not, yep. Eli, it was you. Uh, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so cool. So Very cool. Awesome. Those are books. my two. Okay. Uh, Eric, do you want to go next before I do mine? Yeah, sure. That's actually, that's my favorite Rick Geary book, by the way. I love that one. It's so good. Uh, those ones, those, those murder mystery, murder ones, historical murder ones are so compelling. Like I just, you start them and you can't put them down and they're so beautifully drawn. Mm -hmm. Great I choices, agree. both. <laughs> I'm going to try to share some stuff that um, uh, maybe people don't know that well or, uh, or they do and, and they want to know better. This one, The Happy Undertaker is mm. so Good. It's by uh, a Toronto uh, cartoonist, Draws and Co's Jam. And um, there are these creepy little comics he does <clears throat> that are all silent and just beautifully drawn. You know, all like just the art is just wonderful. He's one of the best artists working in comics. They're very funny, you know, a little dark. Um, another. Another page, just like just wonderful stuff. And he just, this one just launched at TCAF this year, which is called Happy Undertaker 13 Cursed Souls, which is basically you go through and there's 13 different people with weird curses that has made them ugly. It's just wonderful. <laughs> and uh, you can find draws and stuff at uh, drawsandcoastjan.com. And the other one I wanted to share that people might know is uh, Jons Farr and Louis Trondheim's Dungeon. Oh, God, so, yes, yes. So, <laughs> yeah. um, can't get enough of this. I could read this 100 times a day, still be happy. One of my desert island comics. Um, and finally, The Storm in the Barn by Matt Phelan. Always a favorite of mine. Yeah. Great, beautiful stuff. Mm -hmm. More comic people should be reading this. I think it's more of a you know bookstore library book, and I want to see more in the comic people. You know, the the, the comic culture get into Matt Phelan stuff because it's gorgeous. He's an amazing storyteller. He deserves to be as widely read as possible. Um, on my iPad, I also had open Adventure Time, <laughs> the comic which I'm just addicted to. But my iPad died, so you'll have to imagine it. <laughs> <laughs> Now that's that's done by Ryan North, yes. Uh, yes, it is uh, with a variety of artists, um, some great people working on it. It's uh, like it's sort of like the uh, Bongo uh, Simpson comics, and that 
It's quality in and of itself. It's it's a joy to read. Um, it's great for all ages. I just love it. And Chris Houghton, uh, Michigan expat, did the covers on those. Chris Houghton of Reed Gunther, which is another web com- or not, another comic that people should read uh, if, if you haven't. But I don't have that with me today. Reed Gunther, yeah. Reed Gunther is great. Uh, okay, my recommendation is a guy that everybody's been talking about uh, lately, oh. Mr. Tony Cliff. Do you want to ha- borrow this? Well, sure, but you know we're going to get him for um, the Comic oh Artist gosh. Forum. Yes, Comic Artist Forum. In November? Sep- September? No, it's it's oh. October. Oh, it's, it's oh, yeah. October. Oh, hey, Raina. Raina just showed up, and you might want to mute oh, your uh, live stream, Raina. You might want to mute oh, your uh, live stream, Raina. Muted him. There we go. Yes, thank you. Because <laughs> we were coming down <laughs> the speakers. Raina, Raina just showed up, and you might want to mute your uh, live stream, and, Raina. And I'm still hearing it. Okay. You there, Raina? There we go. Yes, thank you. Because <laughs> we were coming down the speakers. It's, it's still doubling up, Raina, so you're, you're listening to the live stream someplace. Okay. Okay. There, Raina. There we go. Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> no, nope. it's still it's looping still around. Hey, Raina, we're going to have to call you back. Because uh, all we're hearing is my audio looping around. I'm going to take the, the mouse away from you, Matt, just for a second so I can hang. There we go. Oh, I got the mouse upside down. This is great audio for everybody after the fact, but uh, there we go. So, Eric, are you still there? Yeah, there's Eric. Oh. And now I got to un- unmute that or call Eric back. <laughs> <laughs> Minor technical difficulty because we were trying something new today, but it was all my fault, everybody. It has nothing to do with Matt. So, uh, Okay, so while, while we get Eric back in the chat, so I want to talk about this guy, mm-hmm. Tony Cliff, who's going to mm-hmm. be at the Ann Arbor District Library mm-hmm. uh, of DelilahDirk.com. This is uh, Delilah Dirk and the Turkish Lieutenant is a webcomic that you can go check out at DelilahDirk.com, and he just did this collection, this short collection of uh, Delilah Dirk and the Seeds of Good Fortune. Uh, which is a print collection you can get at DelilahDirt.com. It is a new story. It's in black and white. It is gorgeous. Yes. And uh, we were talking on the Twitters the other day with uh, Tony, uh, Tango Charlie on Twitter, or Delilah Dirk on Twitter, uh, about uh, how, uh, I think it was Dave Roman, was talking about uh, getting together with some other cartoonist and reading this work and crying because it's so good. and it ma- It's so good it makes us feel bad. But uh, you get this book. I, I got this book for like five bucks. So, wow. I mean, that's, that's a steal for some of this quality. But I'll, I can open it up and show it to you guys. You guys have heard me talk about Tony before. But yeah, let's check out this awesome Family Circus-esque action sequence. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yes. So, okay, Raina, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so, are you ready to announce the? Okay, so we're now we're gonna do. That was my book recommendation was DelilahDirk.com. Now we're gonna talk about drama. We're gonna talk about the who gets the prepub book. A lot of people seem to have tweeted the hashtag. Thank goodness, and some yeah. of them, some of them said some nice things about you, like I asked. So I appreciate that, everybody. Yeah, thanks, you guys. So, um, are we ready? Okay, Raina Telgemeier of GoRaina.com of <laughs> drama. Uh, you are going to announce the winner. Who's gonna get the prepub copy? Let us know. The winner is Michelle Condrich or Condrick of at Miss Illustrator on Twitter. Congratulations, Michelle. So what does she need to do? Um, I'm going to get in touch with her, but she can email me her mailing address and um, I will send that to her via Twitter. Yay! Thanks for entering, Woo. everybody. <laughs> thanks, everybody, for supporting this this book. Uh, d- don't worry if you didn't win. Uh, it's coming out in September, and uh, you know if if you come to uh, Kids Read Comics this summer, uh, kidsreadcomics.org, Rain is going to be there, and you can harangue her to maybe look at a, a pre prepub copy that might be sitting around on the table. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring mine. I'll bring mine just in case, but. Uh, but, Irena, it's an amazing book, and congratulations on it. I cannot wait for this book to come out in September. And thanks for yep, being September part of it. September 1st. Uh, Squastic Graphics is the pub. Cool. All right. Well, we'll let you go, and we'll, uh, but everybody can follow you at GoRena on Twitter, and GoRena.com is the website. And uh, thanks again, Raina, for, for being a part of the ending of this episode. No problem. <laughs> Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. All right. Let's try to get Eric back in here to close this out. Uh, hang up on Raina and let's hit play on the Eric one. And we'll just call him back. How about that? If it'll let me. So while we're getting Eric back on, oh, there he is. Eric? Hi, Eric. Sorry about that. Uh, we had some, some Skype malfunctions. Uh, 
not quite as, as dramatic as Janet Jackson's, but you know, it, 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 it's it stopped the show. <laughs> it, is is that a little bit of a too old of a joke? <laughs> I think it was a little dated. Uh, so okay, uh, we're gonna do uh, announcements about events going on at AADL, and sure. then we'll close out. So. Sure. Uh, there's something exciting coming around the bend this weekend, Sharon Iverson. That would be Janie Ho is going to come back and share with us Adobe Illustrator, um, mm -hmm. a tool that a lot of com comics artists use. Um, she also is a children's book illustrator, and pretty much that is her main tool. So we'll get to see what that's all about. and. Enjoy it. Yes, Janie Ho of ChickenGirlDesign.com. Yep. Uh, celebrated kids illustrator, uh, draws entirely in Adobe Illustrator. She's been on the show a couple times before. She did mm -hmm. a demo of how she draws in Adobe Illustrator, and it was perplexing to me. I It was, it was <laughs> watching somebody speak in another language, and I'm so excited that the Ann Arbor District Library is going to put on, a, 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 a facilitate a Adobe Illustrator's workshop thing mm -hmm. at the Ann Arbor mm -hmm. Comics Artist Forum. So yep. um, that's, the, that's the last one of the year, or of the of summer. The, yeah, so it's this Sunday, June 3rd, 1 to 3, and uh, it will kind of shift into summer mode after uh, after Janie's presentation. And we got lots of comics classes lots. coming up this summer. So Yeah, yeah but, uh, but that will be the last Comics Artist Forum until the fall, and then in the fall, we've got Tony Cliff coming to mm -hmm. do a presentation for us. Uh, did Casey... Casey ever... is coming in December. Casey Van Heis of yeah. Lavelle.com. Yep. Awesome. We have so. James Anderson in September. I think I've got this straight now in my head. <laughs> oh, wow, but man. So yeah, yeah lots, lots more comic stuff mm -hmm. going on at ABL, including Ju July, 7th and 8th this year kidsreadcomics.org is going to be happening at the Ann Arbor mm -hmm. District Library uh, the guest list has been posted and as a matter of fact Eric some of the people you were talking about earlier are, go are actually going to be here Jay Torres is going to be at the show uh, Jack Bibriglio uh, is that how you say his last name? I don't want to butcher it too bad Bibriglio I'm not sure but yeah he's going to be there Dave Roman and Raina Telgemeier are going to be there at, at the, uh, Kids Read Comics and what is it if you haven't heard of this yet it's a two day event actually it's three if you count Friday night because we got a kick off event Friday night uh, a two day free to the public free to attend free for artists to table and all day long every hour there's going to be two to three different free comics workshops going on whether it's learning how to draw an Adobe Illustrator with Janie Ho <coughs> pardon me we're going to have um Drawing workshops, character drawing workshops. Chris Houghton's coming to do a How to Draw Adventure Time Characters workshop. So uh, tons and tons and tons of fun. And, and the, the big idea is to advocate for comics by getting kids excited about comics through making comics. Not just let's meet the, the hero and get the thing signed, but let's participate in something. How awesome would it have been, Eric, when you were a kid to be able to walk right up to, say, Tim Burton and be able to draw next to the guy, right? Amazing. <laughs> exactly. That'd be something that would would transform you forever. So that's what we're trying to achieve with this. And I hope, Eric, we can get you to come next year with your print versions of Marrowbones. I would love to. And and Maddie Kettle will be out as well. So. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So is there is there anything else besides Marrowbones that you wanted to give a shout out to today, Eric? Oh, uh, gosh. You know, I mean, those are my, you know, Marrowbones and Maddie Kettle are my two main projects. And I'm working on a top secret project with uh, Tom Snagorski who wrote some of the uh, Bone novels and the Hellboy, Hellboy novel. And, you know, we're, we're working on a little children something something with uh, with him as well, which I, I, I'm not sure how much I should talk about yet, but uh, that's really exciting. And I'm, I'm doing working on that right now. Oh, very, very cool. Okay, well, then we'll just have to watch you on Twitter, uh, yes. Inky, Inky Bat on Twitter, to find out more about that. And we'll have to get you back for some more talk on this stuff because I didn't get through everything I wanted to cover today. I didn't uh, say everything I want to say, but man, what an honor. This is my favorite podcast. Aww. I'm so, so happy to be here. Look at this guy. He knows yeah. how to treat a host. <laughs> <laughs> And this is where I can say this is a good reminder to everybody. If, if anybody who thought this stuff was good and compelling and more people should listen to it, a great way to support it would be because I mean, you don't have to give me money or anything. You just go to iTunes and give a star review to the show. And that's the number one way people find new podcasts. Uh, or you could you, you could tweet a link. But, I, you know, I'm saying this is a nice anonymous way. Just give a star review and then boom, uh, it pushes us up the ranks and more people will discover the show. And then uh, it'll help out me. It'll also help out guys like Eric because it'll bring him to more people. Right. Mm -hmm. And look at the guy you want to help that guy right he's got that honest face that honest sweet canadian face <laughs> <laughs> and it helps comics that's why we do this thing and that's why we record this show every other week at the ann arbor district library comics.adl.org is where you can find the video podcast for the show it's also on youtube and this uh archived episode will be available at comicsagreat.com slash cag what is this 57 mm -hmm. cag 57 holy moly 
Okay, well, thank you, Sharon Iverson sure. of the Ann Arbor District Library. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Eric Orchard of ericorchard.blogspot.com. And thank you to Matt Dubay, Tom Smith, and Eric Closter of the Ann Arbor District Library and the Ann Arbor District Library proper for putting on this show every other week. And until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of comicsagreat.com. Oh, thanks to Raina uh, and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. And that-